Good morning, happy Sabbath. How many of us are thankful to be here this morning? Amen. How many of us are thankful for the Sabbath day? <clears throat> Thank you so much for the, the special music that was sung. Um, such a beautiful, I love the lyrics to that song. And before we begin, um, we're going to continue, uh, as our custom is, to go into our nightly quiz. But instead of having a nightly quiz, we'll have a morning quiz. And um, for those of us who had answered the questions before, as, as you can tell, we've been going through our Daniel and Revelation seminar. Um, last night, how many of us was here last night? Okay, so for those of us who were here last night, last night was, like me personally, was one of the hardest chapters to ever read or to ever break down in the book of Daniel chapter 10, 11, and 12. When you read through the whole entire book of Daniel, you're going to see that the easiest chapters are chapters 1 through 9. It's very comprehensible. It's very easy to understand. But once you get to Daniel chapter 11, actually, 11 is actually the most hardest chapter ever out of the whole book of Daniel because there's so much details going in. And it's sometimes um, we, not, we may not be a historian and we may not know what these symbols represent. But we're going to have a, a short quiz, and the, the quiz is going to be very simple. It's not going to be hard. And to help us answer this quiz, I want everyone to open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 12. But before we do, let us bow our heads for a short word of prayer. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath morning that you have blessed us with. Father, we want to come to you right now recognizing our need of you. Lord, without you, Lord, we can do nothing. And so, Father, we want to ask for your presence to be with us as we study Daniel chapter 11 and 12, Father, and as we go through the message as well. Give us wisdom and understanding. And we ask also for your Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us into all truth, that the truth shall set us free. Father, thank you so much for your love, for we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. To supplement with your quiz, you can open up your scriptures, your Bible, to Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. Daniel chapter 12. Before I put the first question on the screen here, this will kind of give us a help, like a cheat sheet, but not a cheat sheet, a supplement. How many of you guys like taking quizzes? I see zero hands. It's okay. Okay, so is everybody there in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1? Daniel chapter 12, and we're going to look at verse 1, and why don't we all read this together? Um, Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1, it says, At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time, and at that time your people shall be what everyone? Delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. Okay, with that in mind, we're going to ask some questions about Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. You guys ready, to, ready for the quiz? Remember, if you, if you answered before you are exempt, uh, and you got it right, you are exempted from taking the quiz, so you don't have to worry. But if you do get it right, um, please say your answer in the mic, and then we'll give you a prize as well. All right, first question. Ready? Who is Michael? Any hands? Oh, we have a hand here. You, um, there's, there should be a mic roaming around somewhere. Does anybody have the mic? Her. I'll bring the mic here. And then you can come up and then share your answer with everyone. <laughs> so the question was, who is Michael? 
the only the only one that can defeat Satan is Jesus. So what I think Michael is is Jesus in like battle mode basically. So yeah, that's my answer. Amen. Is he correct? Liam. Liam. <laughs> Don't forget we got prizes. <laughs> Congratulations, correct. The only person who could defeat Satan is none other than Michael. And let me give you this resources. Basically, you can take a picture, you can screenshot it. Um, these are all the places in Scripture where Michael is mentioned in Scripture. And basically, I hope you can see it, Michael fights against the dragon, that's Satan. Michael casts out Satan from heaven. Michael contends with Satan for the body of Moses. Michael resurrects Moses from the grave. Michael resurrects his people from the grave. That's the second coming of Jesus. Michael came to help Gabriel in Daniel chapter 10. Michael upholds Gabriel to the scripture of truth. And Michael delivers his people from the time of trouble. If I was to give one characteristic or trait to the name of Michael, Michael represents Jesus. But if I was to give him one characteristic, it would be a fighter or a warrior, someone who fights for his people. And who is the only one who fights for his people? It's Jesus. Can you say amen? All right, ready for question two? All right, question two is this. Why did Michael stand up? Why did Michael stand up? Any takers or any guesses? So a little bit, maybe a little bit intermediate question or is this too hard? <laughs> Why did Michael stand up? Anyone would like to answer? According to Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1, the answer is found in the verse. You just have to look for it. According to Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, why did Michael stand up? I'll give you some, some time to search the scriptures. Is there any brave soul that would like to answer this question? Why did Michael stand up? We know Michael stands for Jesus, but why did he stand up? Any hands? Would anyone like, okay, yeah, we have a hand back there. You wanna come up front to share? Here, I'll give you the mic. This one works. Okay. To, to, protect his people. to protect his people. Correct. Good job. Okay, you can come and claim your prize here. The prayer of an OFW. Oh, wow. <laughs> Congratulations. Is she correct? Why did Michael stand up? Basically, there is two things. You don't see it in the verse, but there's one thing that, that you do see in the verse. It was to cease his work of the investigative judgment and to come back to save his people. Does that make sense? Why did Michael stand up? Because before, Michael was sitting down and the books were open and he was investigating the books. Then it says Michael stands up. The reason why he stands up is because he's coming back to save his people. That's the second coming of Jesus. And not only the second coming of Jesus, but it was the work to cease his work of investigative judgment. All right, so far so good? Okay, good job. Um, let's go to our final question. Number three, what did Michael do after he stood up? What did Michael do after he stood up? Anyone? 
Okay, I, I think I, I should be fair with you guys. Basically, this is almost the same question as number two. Why did Michael stand up? So to answer this question, what did Michael do after he stood up? Here's the answer. So there's, no, there's not going to be any prizes giving away for the third prize, so sorry. But I will tell you the answer. Michael returned to deliver his people from the earth. That's the straight up answer. Amen? Is Michael good news to God's people? Yes, it, it is good news. And Michael represents none other than Jesus Christ. All right, with that, we are going to begin our, our study for this evening. Uh, this, oh, sorry, evening. This morning, been speaking every night, that's why. Right. Why don't we begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll go into the study. Let us pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we want to ask once more for your presence to dwell with us now as we open your scriptures, as we study prophecy, and as we go through the sermon as well. Speak to us, speak to our hearts. We invite your Holy Spirit to be present. For we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I'm going to give you a breakdown of Daniel, <clears throat> the whole book of Daniel. So basically, we're, we just finished Daniel, the whole book of Daniel. Uh, not the whole book, but we looked at the major prophecies of Daniel. And I'm going to give you kind of like a review so that it's simple, so that we can understand all the material that we're talking about. Okay, so here we have the breakdown of Daniel. In chapters 1 through 6, we're going to see that it's talking basically about history, with the exception of Daniel chapter 2. What happens in Daniel chapter 2? The king has a, has a dream. So everything in chapters 1 through 6 are historic. But in, chapters, uh, in chapter 2, you have an exception, which is the king has a dream of a prophetic image or a prophetic timeline. Then you come to, John, to Daniel chapter 7 through 12, you're going to notice that these chapters talk primarily about prophecy. Talks primarily about what, everyone? Prophecy. So basically, Daniel is breaking up into two, into two groups. You have the history of Daniel, and you have the prophecies of Daniel. History can be found in chapters 1 through 6, chap and then prophecy, Daniel 7 through 12, and chapter 2 as well. Now, what we need to do is we need to go through each single chapter in order to understand fully what the book of Daniel is about. So, here is basically the outline, the history, chapters 1 through 6. And let's, let's read them together on the board. Hopefully, you guys can see. Can everyone see the screen? Yes? Okay. Hopefully, you guys can see it. I'll just move this out. All right. So, let's, let's look at the first chapter. In Daniel chapter 1, we find that Babylon captures Jerusalem in what year? In 605 BC. That's Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 2, we have King Nebuchadnezzar. He has a what kind of a dream? A prophetic dream of a... Do you guys remember the importance of the great image? Why did God give the king an image? Because he worshipped idols or images. In order to speak to King Nebuchadnezzar's mind, God had to show him an image, something that he could be attracted to because he worshipped images and idols and other gods. Chapter 3, King Nebuchadnezzar builds a what kind of an image? He builds a golden image. You guys remember the story of the golden image? And whoever did not worship this image at the sound of the trumpets playing or the music playing, what were they supposed to be uh, doing? They'll be thrown into the fiery furnace. This is what happens in Daniel chapter 3. He builds a golden image. Daniel and his three friends, actually the three friends of Daniel, go into the fiery furnace. And then King Nebuchadnezzar sees a fourth man like the Son of Man, which is Jesus. Jesus was with his people in the fiery furnace. Amen? <clears throat> Daniel chapter 4. King Nebuchadnezzar dreams of a tall tree, which, by the way, reaches into heaven, which it's symbolic, which was chopped down, and he turns into a what, everyone? He turns into a beast for several years, in fact, seven years. And for this seven years, he becomes basically a vegetarian. 
there's something interesting between Daniel chapter 4 and Daniel chapter 1. Remember when Babylon captured Jerusalem? Who was taken captive? Jerusalem, specifically, there's, there's four names. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And in Daniel chapter 1, what, what did the king offer them? He basically offered a full ride scholarship to the University of Babylon, right? And during this, during this uh, training, during this college, what was he feeding, what was he trying to feed Daniel? The wine which they drank and the unclean meats, basically pork. And, on, and the unclean meats and all these things. But did Daniel eat that food? What did he eat? He had the Daniel diet, right? He was vegetarian. He ate plants. How many of us love plants? How many of us woke up this morning and said, I want to eat a plant today? In Daniel chapter 1, Daniel and his friends eat a plant-based diet. In Daniel chapter 4, King Nebuchadnezzar dreams of a tall tree symbolizing himself, how he was so prideful, how Babylon was so prideful, and then that tall tree was chopped down. Basically, he learned the idea of humility, of humbleness. And when he was chopped down, he turned into a beast, and guess what he ate? Plants. He ate the same diet that Daniel and his three friends were eating in Daniel chapter 1. Does that make sense? And as a result of eating this diet, King Nebuchadnezzar gives his heart to Jesus. As a result of humbling himself, as a result of the seven years that he was in, in just by himself, <clears throat> he was humbled by God, he ate plants, and as a result, he gave his heart to Jesus. Let me ask you this question. In, verse, in chapter 1 through 4, do you see God trying to pursue the wicked, evil king of King Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar? Yes. What does that mean to us today? That God loves us no matter what. Amen? No matter how wicked, how sinful you are, you may have been in the past, that does not matter to God. What matters is that He loves us and he'll give us opportunity after opportunity to save us. Daniel chapter 5, King Belshazzar. Who is King Belshazzar? He is the grandson of King Nebuchadnezzar, right? And King Belshazzar basically has a fiesta, a party. You guys remember this in Daniel chapter 5? And what did he see on the wall? He saw a handwriting. And what was on that handwriting? Mene, mene. Teco, teco, you farsen or per perez. What does that, that verse basically mean? You have been found wanting, you have been found weighed in the balance. Simply put, because of your sins, because of your iniquity, because of your uh, pridefulness that you have, your kingdom will be taken away from you and it will be given to who, everyone? Medo-Persia, that very night, the time that he had the great party, guess what happened to the kingdom of Babylon? King Darius comes in and he basically destroys Babylon. They're all drunk. They can't fight. They come in and they destroy, Medo they destroy Babylon in the year 539 B.C. Last but not least, Daniel chapter 6. In Daniel chapter 6, King Darius signs a what everyone what is a death decree it's pad thai not the noodles <laughs> pad thai right a death decree you're going to be killed i want you to notice something in daniel chapter 6 there is a death decree by king darius king darius is the king of what kingdom everyone babylon or medo persia medo persia King Darius signs a death decree to kill Daniel because Daniel was not listening to the leadership there in Medo-Persia. But did you also notice that there was also a death decree in Daniel chapter 2? What happened in Daniel chapter 2? 
in Daniel chapter 2, the king was asking the wise men, tell me the dream and its interpretation. If you cannot provide these two things, what will happen to you guys? You would be petai, and not only that, but your, your house or your family shall be made a hash, an ash heap. Basically, they're going to be burned in the fiery furnace. That was the death decree in Daniel chapter 2. Notice how the death decree is in chapter 2 and in chapter 6. But not only in chapter 2 and chapter 6, there's also another death decree in Daniel chapter 3. Do you guys remember the death decree in Daniel chapter 3? Whoever does not bow down to the golden image at the sound of the music or trumpets will be thrown where? Fiery furnace, patai. Does that make sense, everyone? In Daniel chapter 3, you have a death decree here. Daniel chapter 2, you have death decree. In Daniel chapter 5, that death decree basically took place. And that death decree was when Medo-Persia captured Babylon when they had the party. And then in Daniel chapter 6, King Darius has a death decree on Daniel himself. Daniel is thrown where, everyone? In the lion's den, did the lions eat Daniel? Why not? They weren't hungry? God was there protecting Daniel. Can you say amen? What does that mean to us? We may be thrown in prison. We may be experiencing things that are close to death, but God always protects his own. Can you say amen? God protects people in the lion's den as well. Okay, so this is the history of Daniel chapter 1 through 6. Now we're going to look at Daniel chapter 2, which is prophetic, and then Daniel chapter 7 through 12. Okay, so here is a quick review of what we, stud of what we studied. We're going to start with 2, 7, and 8. So this is basically what we studied. In Daniel chapter 2, we have the first kingdom is Babylon, then Medo-Persia, and then, then, and then, and then God's kingdom. Okay, so in Daniel chapter 2, the king has a dream. King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream about these, uh, these meadows, or you could say these kingdoms, and it sets the tone for everything in the book of Daniel. It sets the tone for prophecy. The reason why is because there is a connection between Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7. When you go to Daniel chapter 7, you're going to see a, an image of a, a beast of a lion and then bear, leopard, terrible beast, ten horns, little horn, judgment, and then God's kingdom. Okay, so when you look and compare these things, you're going to see that the lion parallels with Babylon. The bear parallels with Medo-Persia, leopard with Greece, terrible beast with Rome, ten horns, divided Rome, little horn. Of course, Daniel chapter 2, the king did not have the full complete vision because in Daniel chapter 7, God gave him, we call this the repeat and enlarge principle. As the chapters progress, it's going to be much more clear and more detailed when you come to Daniel chapter 7 especially. So far, so good? Daniel chapter 8, we saw basically a ram, a male goat, a little horn, and then judgment. This is basically summarizing everything that we just talked about. What does the ram represent? It represents Medo-Persia. What does the male goat represent? Greece. Well, how about the little horn? It represents Rome, but specifically papal Rome. It's, it represents specifically pagan or papal Rome, these are the two powers that the little horn was ruling. And last but not least, you have the judgment. In Daniel chapter 8, did, did God reveal to Daniel the exact date of the judgment when it would start? Yes or no? No, correct. What did God reveal to Daniel in Daniel chapter 8? He just said, unto 2,300 days, then the what shall be cleansed? Then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. But he did not give an exact date. And basically, this is the sanctuary. 
This was the sanctuary that was supposed to be cleansed. Now, the next question that I have is, why is there a need for the sanctuary to be cleansed? And what sanctuary are we talking about here? Is it the sanctuary here on earth or the sanctuary up in heaven? heaven. In heaven. How do you know it's heaven? Because the sanctuary on earth has already been uh, done away with. It already has been depleted. You remember when Jesus died on the cross and then the, the curtain was split in two and it started from the top going, going downwards? It basically symbolized that the sanctuary services are no more here on earth. But the sanctuary services in heaven still kept going. Now the question that I have is why was it so defiled? Why does the sanctuary in heaven needs to be cleansed if heaven is a perfect place? What is in heaven? Our sins. Does that make sense, everyone? Our sins are in heaven. Not that there is, there is sinning in heaven, but our records of our sins are in heaven. And the sanctuary in heaven needs to be cleansed. Why does it need to be cleansed? Because our sins are up there. What will the sanctuary be cleansed? How will the sanctuary in heaven be cleansed? With whose blood, everyone? Jesus' blood. Does that make sense, everyone? Not our blood, meaning to say we can't save ourselves. Salvation is not by works. It is through Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? And we also saw that here in Daniel chapter 8, there was this power called the, the little horn. And what did the little horn attempt to do? He attempted to remove the sanctuary services. You remember when it says in Daniel chapter 8 that the daily was removed and the sanctuary services were taken away? How did the little horn, by the way, who is the little horn? Rome or papal Rome, you could say. How was the little horn taking away the sanctuary services? Let's start here. In the, uh, in the altar of burnt, uh, burnt offering, it represents sacrifice, right? The death of Jesus. Was the death of Jesus replaced by the Roman Catholic Church theology? Yes. How? Basically, you don't have to go to a priest to confess. Sorry, you don't have to go to Jesus to confess your sins. You can just simply go to one of the priests in the Roman Catholic Church. Does that make sense, everyone? How about the labor? What does the labor represent? Baptism. Did the Roman Catholic Church try to remove baptism? How? Sprinkling of babies. Does that make sense? How about the table of showbread? What does the table of showbread represent? It represents the Word of God. Did the Roman Catholic Church try to remove the Word of God from His people? When? During the Dark Ages, correct. How about the table, I mean the candlestick? What does that represent? The Holy Spirit and the power to witness, you know, they were the light of the world. Jesus is basically said, you are the light of the world, right? Did they ever try to remove the light from the world? How? The dark ages. How about the altar of incense? The altar of incense represents prayers. I kind of mentioned that in here in the altar of burnt offering. But the altar of incense, this is the one where they confess their sins to a priest rather than to Jesus. Does that make sense, everyone? Okay. The altar of burnt offering, this is where the sacrifice of Jesus takes place. They substituted this. Are you guys familiar with the Eucharist? You guys, you guys know what communion service is? You remember when they eat the bread and they drink the wine? They believe that drinking the wine or drink, eating the bread is the literal blood and the literal body of Jesus that was sacrificed for them. Did you guys know that? They believe that it was the literal body, the physical, actual, literal blood of Jesus. When we do communion service, it is only symbolic, right? It is not the literal blood. 
they basically did that to replace Jesus. They wanted to take away Jesus from ministering in the heavenly sanctuary to replace it with their own theology of salvation. Basically, salvation by works. Salvation by what, everyone? Meaning you can only work your way to heaven. You can't uh, go through God. You have to come through the Catholic Church. And by, by God's grace, I, I hope nobody takes this the wrong way. Um, I'm sharing this out of a heart of love. I love Catholics. I'm talking about here about the system of the Catholic Church, not the people. In fact, my dad was, he grew up Catholic. He was an altar boy growing up. Any, any former Catholics or Catholics in here? I understand how you feel. And so I grew up with my dad being Catholic and my mom being Adventist. Last but not least, the Ark of, um, here we have the Ark of the Covenant. What is inside the Ark of the Covenant? You have the Ten Commandments and Aaron's rod that budded, which represents the Word of God. Did the Catholic Church ever try to replace the Word of God and the Ten Commandments? How? They attempted to change times and laws. They had their own Roman Catholic Church Bible and they had their own commandments. The commandments was replaced by their own theology. Does that make sense, everyone? Okay. They basically, the theology of the Catholic Church is basically that you could save yourself in salvation. Have you guys ever heard of penance? penance, you basically pay your sins. If you have sins, you basically pay it off so that you could be in heaven. And if you don't pay it off, then you could per perhaps stay in purgatory for a while or go to hell if you don't pay it. Does that make sense, everyone? Okay. Now we're going to move on to Daniel chapter 9. This is just simply review, simple review. In Daniel chapter 9, we see a 70 weeks prophecy. In the 70 weeks prophecy, there are five basic major events that happen in this 70 weeks prophecy. The first event happened in what year, everyone? 457 BC. In 457 BC, King Artaxerxes gave the command to what, everyone? Restore and build Jerusalem. The command was given to restore and, and build Jerusalem. In 408 BC, what happened? Jerusalem was finally restored and it was finally built. Now, what happened in 27 AD? Jesus is baptized or he is anointed. In 31 AD, what happens to Jesus, everyone? Jesus is crucified. He dies on the cross for all of humanity. And then in 34 AD, the gospel is rejected by the Jews and now it is preached to who, everyone? The Gentiles, the, the non-believing Christians. This is basically the timeline. 457, 408, 27 AD, 31, and 34 AD. Now, what was the purpose of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem? I'm sorry. What was the purpose of, of this decree that Artaxerxes gave? <laughs> to restore and to build Jerusalem. Now... <clears throat> Why were they supposed to restore and build Jerusalem? Because they were because Jesus was about to come here on the scene and they were supposed to prepare their what everyone? Their hearts to to receive the Messiah. Do you remember the 70 weeks prophecy? There was a list in Daniel chapter 9 and it said that 70 weeks are determined. By the way, what does determined mean? Cut off or pad thai. <laughs> cut off basically means to die, and cu cut off also means it's determined. Okay, so 70 weeks was, was supposed to be given to the Jews, to Jerusalem, for what specific purpose? It was to get rid of sin, basically. Why? Because Jesus would come in what year, everyone? 
in 27 AD. Basically, they had 69 years or 69 prophetic years to prepare their hearts to receive the Messiah. Now, I'm going to ha have a big question for everyone. Since 1844, what were God's people supposed to be doing from this point on to the future? They were supposed to do basically everything <clears throat> that the Jews was asked to do from 457 to 408. Not just to restore and build Jerusalem, but it was so that their temples, their spiritual temples would be prepared to receive who, everyone? The Messiah. Meaning to say, since 1844, God's people was supposed to be preparing their hearts to receive their coming king, Jesus. And when would, the, when would Jesus come back? When Michael stands. When Michael stands, after a short period of time, he will come back to save his people. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. And then we looked at Daniel chapter 11 and 12. This is a quick review of what we studied last night. Um, I know we don't have all the time, and I know Daniel 11 and 12 is one of the most hardest chapters, but here is a simple outline, a simple breakdown of all the things that we've studied. All right, so it starts off in Daniel chapter 11, verse 1 to 2. It starts off with what kingdom, everyone? Medo-Persia. And it's going to talk about that it had four kings. You have the King Cyrus, King Darius, King Darius I, and Artaxerxes. These are the four kings that ruled in Medo-Persia. Then what kingdom do you have next? Greece. What comes after Greece? Rome. In, in Rome, in fact, actually, let's open our Bibles to Daniel chapter 11. Turn with me really quick. Daniel chapter 11. I want to show you something interesting here. Daniel chapter 11, and look at verse 22. Look at verse 22. Are you guys there? Okay. I'm sorry, look at verse 20. Let's start with verse 20. There shall arise in his place one who imposes taxes... On the glorious kingdom but within a few days he shall be destroyed not in anger or in any battle when you look when you look at this verse it's basically describing Rome and it's basically describing Caesar Augustus who is Caesar Augustus he's the Emperor of Rome then after that in verse 21 and in his place shall arise a vile person to whom they will not give the honor of royalty, but he shall come in peacefully and seize the kingdom by intrigue. Does anybody know who is the next one that comes after Augustus Caesar? You can look it up in, Dan, uh, in Luke chapter 2 and Luke chapter 3, both in verse 1. The next person that comes after Augustus Caesar is Tiberius Caesar. And you remember what happened in the, year, in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar? Who was baptized? Jesus was baptized in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. When you look at Daniel chapter 11, this verse is basically talking about the time of Rome. And then when you continue going on, if you look at verse 23, I'm sorry, with 22, with the force of a flood, they shall be swept away from before him and be what, everyone? What does the word broken mean? It means patai. Because notice what it says in the next statement. It says, they shall be broken, and then, and also the prince of the covenant. Who is the prince of the covenant, everyone? That's Jesus. The prince of the covenant is broken, meaning the prince of the covenant, Jesus, is going to die. What year did Jesus die? In what Rome? In what time period? Was it Medo-Persia? Was it Greece? Or was it Rome? It was Rome. Jesus died during the time period of Rome. In Daniel chapter 11, it talks about Jesus' birth, his baptism, and his death. 
you probably can't see it when you surface read, but when you dig deeper, when you study Scripture with Scripture, you're going to see that the Prince of the Covenant represents Jesus, and it's talking about His death, that He was broken. He died. Okay, the next power that comes after Rome is what, everyone? In Papal Rome, and when did they rule? From 538 until... 1798 that is known as the the dark ages during and you can find that in daniel chapter 11 verse 29 to 39 after papal rome rule then you're going to see in verse 40 daniel chapter 11 verse 40 you're going to see an attack between the king of the south and the king of the north the king of the south is going to approach the king of the north by the way the king of the north represents rome papal rome the king of the south represents atheism through the power of France. France gave that deadly blow, that deadly wound to the papal Rome. How? You remember who was the person that took the pope captive? Does anybody know? Berthier, General Berthier. And General Berthier was a general under what kingdom? France. Who took away the sword from Papal Rome? It was France through General Berthier. What did General Berthier do? He went into the kingdom of Rome, took the Pope captive, brought him in exile, and the Pope basically died in 1798. Does that make sense? Since 1798, it received what we know in Scripture, also in, in, in Revelation chapter 13, as a what kind of a wound? A deadly wound you can look it up in Revelation chapter 13 it mentions deadly wound in there and that deadly wound happened in what year everyone in 1798 this is basically the papacy is temporarily destroyed but later on in prophecy you're gonna see that the deadly wound is is healed Meaning, meaning to say that one day the deadly wound will receive the power of the sword. In 1798, you have church and state. Church, basically, the church, and then the state through the armies. Another way of looking at the church and state is basically the church has the power of the sword to kill, to enforce, right? Did they enforce their laws during this period called the Dark Ages? Yes, they did. How many people have been persecuted during this Dark Ages? History tells us there's about 50 million Christians that have been slain for the Word of God. They were martyrs during this Dark Ages. But in 1798, France, the King of the South, came to the King of the North, which is Papal Rome, removed the power of the sword basically removed the armies from them by using General Berthier, French General, um, General Berthier, to take the Pope captive. Is this making sense, everyone? Amen? The deadly wound happened in 1798, but later on, the deadly wound is healed, and then the papacy begins to heal. The way you're going to see that the papacy is going to be healed, you can look at this verse too, but also refer back to Revelation chapter 13. When you look in Revelation 13, you're going to see that someone helped the little horn or papal Rome to be healed. What power healed or will heal papal Rome? Does anybody know? It's the United States of America. United States of America will give the power of the sword, basically to kill, to the power of Papal Rome, the church, and as a result, church and state will unite in the future. It has not happened yet. I hope that's clear. It has not happened yet, but one day, church and state will unite. Does that make sense, everyone? Right now, in the times that we're living in, if you look currently in our news, in our world news, you're going to see there's a lot of ties between the Catholic Church and the United States of America. One day, according to prophecy, them two, these two nations will unite. And then they're going to 
United States will give the power of the sword back to Rome. Basically, now they can kill people. And they will establish this thing called a national Sunday law. A what, everyone? A national Sunday law. That national Sunday law is going to be globally announced. And then as a result, later on after the national Sunday law, a death decree, a what, everyone? A death decree, a pad thai decree, will be given to the whole entire world, basically saying, if you do not worship the image of the beast, huh. if you, it's basically a repeat of, of history in Daniel chapter uh, 3. At the sound of music, if you hear the music, if you do not bow down, you'll be thrown into the fiery furnace, death decree. Does that make sense, everyone? Okay. Deadly wound is healed. Papacy begins to heal. Who helps the papacy to heal? It's the United States of America. Don't quote it, uh, don't quote it from me. Look it up for yourself in Revelation chapter 13. You're going to see the connection there. Then, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, you see that who stands up? Michael stands up, which basically means that probation is closed. And then it, it mentions about a time of trouble that happens as never were before. What does this time of trouble mean? It's the seven last plagues. Who is the seven last plagues specifically for? Turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 16. We're going to look at verse 1 and 2. I'm going to show you who the seven last plagues or who the time of trouble is specifically for. Revelation chapter 16. If you have your Bibles. Revelation chapter 16, looking at verse 1 and 2. This is, Revelation 16 is the seven last plagues. It says here, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of, uh, of God on the earth. Verse 2. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the man who had the what, everyone? the mark of the beast, and those who worshipped his image. This is, the, the, the verse that we just read is the seven last plagues. And who specifically is the seven last plagues for? Those who worship the image and those who have the mark of the beast. Does anybody know who the beast is? Here's the beast, brothers and sisters. Papal Rome or the papacy. Whoever worships, not literally worships, but worships on their day of worship, and the mark of the beast, of course, also includes enforced Sunday worship. If they worship on that day, they would not receive the mark of the beast. But whoever does not worship on that day will receive the mark of the beast. And whoever receives the mark of the beast and worships the image will go through the time of trouble, which are the seven last plagues. Daniel is so clear about this. After the time of trouble, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, it talks about the second coming of Jesus. Did you guys see that in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1? Turn with me in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. Daniel chapter 12. This is, this is profound stuff that we're studying here. In Daniel chapter 12, in verse 1, at the time, Michael shall stand. Who is Michael? Michael represents Jesus. He shall stand, meaning probation has closed. The great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a what, everyone? A time of trouble. What is the time of trouble referring to? The seven last plagues. There shall be a time of trouble. In Daniel, Daniel already saw the time of trouble. <laughs> and then it says, uh, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time, and at that time, your people shall be what, everyone? When does God's people become delivered? It's the second coming of Jesus. Amen? God comes as a conquering king. And God 